name to be praised and that is the name of Jesus. As we all know, life lately has been very challenging and difficult for many of us, probably all of us, hasn't it? So much change and uncertainty. And when we're going through hardship or someone we know and love is struggling, it's natural to want to do something to help, right? Um, And it's tempting for me and possibly you as well to search frantically for solutions and options. But perhaps our first response should be to engage in prayer for ourselves or on behalf of others. Paul the Apostle made an amazing discovery about prayer when he was going through a hard time. In Philippians 1.19, he said, For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. He was going through a hard time, but he knew that relief from his difficult situation was connected to the Philippian people praying for him. Prayer for others is powerful. Um, James 5.16 says, The prayers of a righteous person, that's a follower of Jesus, is powerful and effective. Wow. That means your prayers and my prayers are powerful and effective. So let's pray for others and ourselves as one of the very first things we do when we face a challenge because as the song we're about to sing says, we sing and pray to a God who always makes a way.
Good morning, everyone. Please feel free to take a seat. Uh, my name is Michael, and I'd like to welcome you to City Reach Oakton this morning. Uh, what a blessing it is to meet together in God's house, isn't it? Isn't it a blessing to be here today? I mean, I, I, I feel it, right? Because um, last week, we couldn't meet face to face. Uh, we were meeting remotely. The week before that, I was on holidays. So I've actually missed out on meeting with all of you for the last two Sundays. And I've actually really missed it. And so I, I really do feel like there's joy, joy in my heart that I can meet with God's people this morning. And why is that? Because we get to worship together today. And that is, that is just a blessing to be able to worship with God's people together. We get to come under the sound of God's word being preached to us. You know, God's truth, God's handbook for life is going to be preached to us this morning. And we get to hear that together as uh, God's people in this place. Uh, but more than that, you know, before the service and after the service, we get to meet together and we get to encourage one another. We get to be the church to one another, to, to bear one another's burdens, to show love to one another. And that is just um, such a, a wonderful privilege and a blessing. And so I hope you feel like it's a privilege. I hope you make the most of this opportunity um, that we can meet together. It's a special thing when God's people get to meet together. So how about if I just pray and ask for the Lord to be with us in this service today? So join with me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we just want to say thank you so much that you've given us this opportunity to meet together. Lord, we don't want to take it for granted, but we want to make the most of it. Lord, it is encouraging to our hearts to get alongside one another, to see how our friends and our church family are, are going. But also, Lord, we, we want to open our hearts to you. We invite you uh, to speak to us today through your word and through worship. And Lord, we want to hear from you because if we don't if, if you're not with us, if you don't speak to us, then we're just wasting our time. So we invite you, Lord, because it says in your word, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. And so, Lord, we invite you to speak into our hearts today. We invite you to be amongst us and to help us to encourage one another and that we might be a blessing to one another. So please be with us today, God. Um, we look forward to hearing from you today, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, we have a special treat today. We have uh, Tim Patrick from Bible College of South Australia coming to, uh, to bring us uh, God's Word today. And we're going to find out a little bit more about him. So we're going to have Pastor Graham coming up on stage as well as uh, Tim, and they're going to uh, have a little interview. So uh, can you welcome, up, welcome them up together? Put your hands together. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Good morning, church. It is, like Michael said, it is really special that we can meet in person. There's nothing quite like seeing uh, brothers and sisters face to face. So I have Tim Patrick with me this morning, and Tim's going to be, as Michael said, bringing us the word from Exodus 32. And uh, we caught up uh, a couple of weeks or maybe a month ago yep. when you were on sabbatical. Correct. Now, you're the principal of Bible College South Australia. Yep. And we had a coffee, and you were busy writing some major paper, which I didn't have any idea about. Uh, but who's Tim Patrick? Who's the family man behind the, the principal? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yes, so my day job is principal at the Bible College of South Australia, but my bigger task and responsibility is uh, to be with my family. Uh, I'm married to Katrina, Cat, uh, uh, and we have three kids, uh, Poppy, who's uh, 20, uh, and then jumping down to Jonty, who's eight, and Remy, who's five. So I, I tell people we're, we're parenting at both ends of the spectrum which is delightful uh, in all of the exhaustion that it brings. Um, those of you who are parents understand this. Um, but, you know, we embrace the chaos. It's yeah. lovely. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's any parents in the room would know. It is about embracing the chaos and, and trusting God's grace through it. Um, okay, Tim, back to Bible College South yeah. Australia. What about BCSA is important for us to know? Here we're sitting at City Reach Oakton. Uh, what's important for us to know about Bible College South Australia? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, I have uh, got a brochure for you that uh, tells you a bit more about the college. You can have a look at that at some time. But perhaps the simplest way to understand it is um, we're a ministry you might not often see or always hear because we're kind of the ministry behind other ministries. So what we do is we train and prepare people for Christian service. And we do that by offering uh, degrees and diplomas, things like what you get at university and other courses, but for Bible and theology, you do it at a Bible college. Uh, and we um, train people out who then go and work in the ministries you know. So we train pastors for churches. Um, I think of City Reach Marion with uh, Lawson and, um, now I can't think of 
Uh, Luke. Luke, beg your pardon? Luke, Luke, Luke Watts. Don't tell him I forgot. He's such a dear guy. <laughs> uh, Lawson and Luke, they both came through us. Um, we have missionaries who've trained with us and gone out on the mission field, uh, chaplains, people like that. So I often think if you care about all these ministries that happen around our city, um, you care about churches, well, we train the pastors. If you care about overseas ministry and mission, well, we train missionaries. If you care about chaplains in school, we, we train them and, and other people too, people working on university campuses and uh, different types of places. Um, so that's really what we are. We're kind of the ministry behind the ministries. We're not always seen, but the way I think about it as well is if you took us out of the mix, you'd feel it. You'd feel it because suddenly uh, Adelaide and South Australia would become more dependent on other places. You know, if we need a pastor, we'd get on the phone and ring up Sydney or Melbourne or overseas and say, we need a pastor, can you help us? Which is crazy, because we've got so many passionate believers. Yeah. We can train here. Yeah. We've got world-class training, uh, and we can produce our own under God to serve the mission field here. Amen. Mm. Amen. So how can we, as a church, mm. I guess, uh, support and partner BCSA? What can we be doing? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, the first thing I'd say is... Um, we really need people to think about training for gospel ministry. Mm. Uh, that is, it might be that you're passionate for the Lord and you might be kind of doing something else with your life, which is a great thing to do, but I'd like churches to be in conversation with each other, uh, sisters and brothers in the Lord, to be in conversation with each other about which of us should be putting our hand up to maybe go and get trained in Bible theology and ministry and, and serve in a vocational sense. Mm. Um, you know, prodding each other, challenging each other, raising up, because if the next generation of gospel workers don't come out of churches, where are they going to come from? Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. the church who's got to produce them. So that's one thing you could do is uh, have that conversation. Uh, other thing is um, we really depend on the financial support of our partner churches. That's just how it is. We don't get government support like universities, even though we're teaching uh, full degrees like universities. So our funding model is part student fees and a large part donor support. So we mm. treasure that. But probably top of the list is prayer. Okay. Um, we send out a prayer email once a month. You can sign up for that in here. Uh, and to pray for us would be wonderful. Yeah. Now, talking about prayer, that's exactly what I'd like to do Thank for you. you right now. So if you can join me, let's pray for Tim. And, and like all of us, I'm guessing it's going to be a challenging season uh, moving into the next couple of months teaching. Yeah. At uni, and like we've got a, a bunch of teachers, and we've got a school here, yeah. and they're facing yeah. similar challenges. Yeah, so yeah. let's let's pray. For thank you, you. Uh, Father. Thank you for for Tim. Just thank you for what you've called him to. Lord, I pray that you would give him uh, the grace and the favour and the wisdom to lead through this season. Father, I pray that you would strengthen him, that you would strengthen the team that you have around him. Uh, of the staff members, the lecturers, the admin staff, Lord Jesus, I pray that they would be of one heart and one mind to serve you with all their hearts, Lord. Lord, I pray for the students that would be learning about you and diving into your word, Lord. I, I pray that this season wouldn't stop the, the wonder of your gospel taking root in their lives. And Father, you said, you said the the gospel is plentiful. I mean, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Mm. And Father, we pray for more, more harvest workers. Would mm. you raise up leaders uh, who are passionate about you, who long to see people come to know you and to teach them your ways and to be salt and light in this generation, Lord. Father, we pray for today, for the message, Lord. I pray that as Tim preaches, would he preach with boldness and authority, uh, and I pray for us as hearers of the word that we wouldn't just be hearers of the word, but we'd be doers of the word too. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Well, let's stand to our feet and praise the Lord again. I wonder how many reasons are there to bless the Lord? Are there 10, 100, 1,000? Maybe 10,000, I reckon more. So let's do that right now. Sing the Lord.
our church news and you can be seated. Thanks. Hello,我是Pastor 無論你是實體或者是網上或者是第一次來我們都是歡迎你現在我的同工我的幹事叫Gill 欢迎您的出席来了解教会新的一年的意向。下周日，也就是二月六日，是教会的意向主日。在这天，我们将庆祝神为我们这个教会大家庭所做的一切，也为了我们新的一年的计划，向神祷告祈求他的智慧和祝
uh, in two weeks' time on February the 13th. You can come along and hear a little bit more about our church, and you have the opportunity just to be able to ask questions and to have them answered and just to get to meet a few new people. So if that's you, if you're new to our church, we'd love to have you along at Starting Point. Uh, you can sign up at our information desk in the foyer, or you can ring the church office during the week. So Starting Point Lunch and Ecclesiastes series, both starting uh, in two weeks' time on February 13th. Well, now we're going to come to God's Word. So if you have your Bible with you, it doesn't matter whether it's a physical Bible like I've got here or whether you've got one on your smartphone, uh, open it up and we're going to go to Exodus chapter 32. This is the, uh, the story of the golden calf and we're looking forward to uh, Tim bringing us the message in a moment. So Exodus 32, it'd be great for you to follow along because I'm going to be reading the whole chapter. Exodus 32 starting in verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered to themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So the people so all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up from out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow there shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I have commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation of you. But Moses implored the Lord, his God, and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever." And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with, his two, with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back, they were written. The tablets were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is noise of war in the camp. But he said, it is not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to a powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. And Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people, that they are set on evil. For they said to me, Make us gods, who shall go before us? As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, Let any who has any gold take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. And when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break, 
loose to the derision of their enemies. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp, and each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day, about 3,000 men of the people fell. And Moses said, Today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. The next day, Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people have sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will, forgive their sin. But if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Then the Lord sent a plague upon the people because they made the calf, the one that Aaron made. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thank you very much for that uh, important but um, sobering text. Let me start with a question for us. Do you think that uh, all sins are the same, or are some sins bad and some not so bad? Are there degrees of sin? If you ask that question, uh, like I just did, uh, are some sins bad and some not so bad, then I think you have to say, no, that's not right at all. Uh, the Bible throughout is insistent that all sin is an affront to God. All sin is abhorrent. All sin is a high-handed rejection of God, and all sin deserves God's punishment, no question about it. But if you ask the question like this, are some sins bad and other sins absolutely horrific, then the answer might be yes. The answer might be yes. So, for example, uh, it's bad, it is a sin to vent your anger at someone. That is, that is a sin and that is bad. But it is horrific to murder a whole bunch of people. That's even worse. Uh, it's a sin, it's bad to glance over someone who's not your spouse or not your fiancé, perhaps. That's a sin, that's bad. But it's horrific to be a serial adulterer. Uh, it's, it's bad to steal a chocolate bar from the local shop. That's a sin, that's wrong, that's against God's will, it's bad. But it's horrific to cheat a pensioner out of their life savings. Some sins are bad, and some sins are horrific. Exodus 32 presents to us an horrific sin. In fact, it's almost the archetypal sin of the people of Israel. It's their worst sin. It's the thing that outlines what sin looks like when it's as bad as sin can be. It's a terrible sin that we read in this story. It leaves a stain on their history and it reveals the depths of evil within this people. And it's not just the sin itself that makes it so bad, it's also the context in which this sin happens. The context in which it happens. Because God has just showed his great love for his people. He, he's just used his great power to rescue them. And they have committed this terrible sin right on the heels of that. So the golden calf incident is not just like being a mass murderer, as though that weren't bad enough. It's like being a mass murderer of the people who just saved your life. It's not just like 
cheating a pensioner out of their life savings, it's like cheating a pensioner out of their life savings after they had just for no reason decided to bless you with a huge financial gift. It's not just a sin. It's shameful. It's thankless. It's offensive. It's insulting to God in light of what he's just done for them. Now, we've just heard the Bible read, uh, and let me uh, remind us of the context of Exodus 32, because, again, where it comes is so significant to what's being said here. Uh, you might know that uh, in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, it, that book closes off with the family of Jacob, uh, Jacob, whose other name, of course, was Israel, uh, gathered in the land of Egypt under the protection of Joseph, one of Jacob's sons, who was uh, the, effectively the prime minister of Egypt at the time. That's how the book of Genesis closes. Open up the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible, which we're in now, and in Exodus we have the, that family of Jacob has grown now to hundreds of thousands of people, and they now present a political threat to the nation of Egypt. And the new pharaoh uh, doesn't know anything about that history. Uh, Joseph is long gone, and he sees them as a group within his own nation. That's a threat to them. And so he enslaved them. He made them slaves of the nation, put them into forced labor under harsh conditions. He internally oppressed them within the land. And the people cried out to God at the opening of the book of Exodus. They cried out to God for deliverance. And God heard their cry and raised up for them Moses. Moses the man who would be God's agent to deliver them from their circumstances. And through Moses, a bunch of plagues came on the land of Egypt. And eventually, the new Pharaoh, when he realized the power of God was against him, he relented and he let God's people go. And so you have the Exodus event when they leave Egypt uh, with Moses uh, leading them off uh, through the Red Sea and on their journey to freedom and on their journey to a land that will be their own land where they'll be free to worship God and not be enslaved, not be oppressed, but be a people under the rule of God in the place of God, free to worship him. On the way, however, they stop at Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai uh, is where Moses goes up with Joshua, his companion, and receives from God the Ten Commandments. And this is kind of like, it's kind of like a marriage contract. God has been good to the people. They've followed God up to this point. And he says, let's formalize it now. Here's what it looks like when we write this contract. And so God is binding himself to the people in a formal covenant relationship that's meant to last all the generations. And also, up on Mount Sinai, Moses receives instructions for the tabernacle, which is a big tent that will travel with the people and be set up in the middle of the camp of the people. It will be God's house. He's going to live with them. He's going to live among them. And this kind of takes you right back to the, the Garden of Eden, where God himself walked with Adam and Eve. He was there with them in their presence. Those times are coming back. He's going to live among them. So this is a really great thing that's been happening for the people. The story's been fantastic, and Moses is up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, finding out how God's going to dwell among his people, and while that's happening, chapter 32 is happening on the plains below. What we're going to do now is just go through this chapter again, and I just want to highlight some of the things that come out of it that make it so shocking and show us the things we need to learn, because there's a lot in this that's really relevant to us even though our circumstances are somewhat different. This is what unfolds while Moses is up the mountain. Well, it starts out in verse 1 that Moses has been there a long time, and the people are feeling impatient. They feel like, well, where's Moses now, and where's the God of Moses? Uh, we have a need for him to be with us now, giving us the things we want and doing us the things that we ask, and he's not here, so let's have new gods. Let's have new gods. It's stunning, isn't it? It's a stunning thing to do. But actually, it's not that surprising at one level because human beings are wired to worship. We are hardwired to worship. And sadly, that means if we have short memories or if we have shallow hopes, then we'll worship anything. We'll worship anything that's put in front of us. 
But there's no worship vacuum. Something has to be there. It is, of course, unbelievable in light of what's just happened to the nation uh, and what they've just experienced of God. They've had this powerful salvation. They've been led into freedom. They've been provided with food in the desert. All these incredible things God's done for them, but they're quick to abandon him when he's not right there at their beck and call, uh, giving them instant responses to everything they could ask for. And this is a really good word for us, actually, because we live in a culture of instant gratification. We live in a culture where we want stuff and we get in our computers and click it and it should be delivered within a couple of days. We want things now. And it would be easy for us to say, well, if the God of the Bible, the true God of Scripture, is not delivering me what I want right now, if he's not right here in my lounge room fulfilling my every wish, well, then I'm going to find an alternative. I'm going to find an alternative. I'm going to give myself to shopping or the foodie culture or just personal entertainment or some kind of pleasure. That's what's going to rule my life. That's what's going to direct my life. Those things that give me immediate satisfaction and gratification. That's part of the human condition. Uh, What's doubly shocking though in our story, Exodus 32, is that Aaron... Moses' brother, who was, uh, seems left in charge down the foot of the mountain while Moses went up, Aaron capitulates to the people's wishes. They ask for this horrendous thing, this sinful thing, and Aaron, their leader, says, yeah, okay, good idea, let's do that. He gives them what they want. It's, it's incredible that he would do this in his role. He collects from the people uh, lots of their, their riches, their, their gold earrings and, and the gold that they have, which, by the way, was given to the people by God uh, from the Egyptians when they left Egypt. They plundered the Egyptians. It was God showing his power over Egypt. And now they're saying, let's take these gifts of God and make them into another God. They make them into another God, and that's what they do, don't they? They cast this, this calf, this gold calf, and it's an idol. And the people say, behold, Uh, Here is the God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. This metal calf that they made in a furnace. And Aaron sees this and thinks, oh, that's good. Let's not just uh, have that. Let's have a festival. Let's, Let's worship this God. Let's actually have a ritual where we get around and gather and praise and glorify this hunk of metal that we cast in the furnace. They say, this is the God who led us up out of the land of Egypt. I mean, it's shocking on so many levels, isn't it? They're not just saying uh, this piece of metal that we made is the true and living God, but they say all the things that God has done for us, all the things, the blessings we've received from him, all that deliverance from Egypt was done not by him but by this thing. Uh, it's, It's offensive to God. Of course, it's the kind of thing that Many of us do all the time as well, or we run the risk of doing. We might look at our uh, prosperity. We might look at our health. We might look at our freedom. We might look at our great family. We might look at uh, all the blessings we have around us, and we might say, oh, these things come because we've got a particular form of stable government, or because we have a particular economic system, or because of a particular institution, or dare I say, because of a particular church institution, or actually, ultimately, because of me, because I did it, I arranged it, I organized these things, and so it goes well with me. And we we so have this inclination, don't we? Um, You know, at my worst times, I can look at people whose lives are rough and on the rocks, and I think, oh, yeah, that's because of something you've done wrong, whereas, you know, my life has all the blessings it does because I didn't make that mistake. It's about me. It's, it's, it's crazy and, and it's, it's idolatrous. It's ascribing the good things that God has given to something else, be it an institution, be it a government, be it ourselves. God can use those things, of course. God can use governments, God can use institutions, God can use all sorts of things to bring blessings. But if we don't ultimately recognize that the blessings in our life, the good things we have, the good things that we've had in our history, if we don't ultimately recognize that they come from God, it's idolatry. It's, it's praising something else other than God. It's idolatry. And of course, this arouses God's anger. 
And we see in verses 7 to 10, God is angry at the people for the way that they have responded to his grace. And and notice what's going on there. A few things happen. God disowns them. He, He talks to Moses about your people, your people who you led up, not my people anymore. God's disowning them. And God says he's going to destroy them, wipe them out. And he has a new plan. He says, I'm going to make a nation out of you, Moses. I'm just going to take you and through your offspring and your family, we'll start afresh a new nation with you. God says, I'm done with his people. I disown them. I'm going to destroy them and start afresh. And, you know, it sounds harsh, but again, in the flow of the story, if you follow the narrative, this is really what they deserve. This is what they deserve. These are people who have said, the God of life, the God of prosperity, the God of goodness, we're not interested in. And so God says, okay, then be without life. Be without goodness. Be without prosperity. You turn your back on the one who gives you those things, then you lose those things. Really, the judgment is just a direct consequence of the sin. If you don't seek out the Lord of life, then you can expect death. This is what comes. And God says, this is what's happening to these people. He is so insulted and offended at their sin that he says, let them have what they're asking for. Judgment and abandonment to the things that don't come from me. Now, it's important for us to note there's something new going on here in the story of the history of Israel. Up until now, the people of God have required God's help and saving from external problems. Their issues have been outside themselves. So they were oppressed in Egypt. The problem was the oppressors, the ones out there who we needed saving from. They were trapped by the Red Sea in Exodus 14. They had their back to the wall, as it were, their back to the water. Uh, Those external conditions were their problem, and they needed a way out that God provided. Uh, Or they were in the wilderness, and they had no food, nothing to eat. So Exodus 16, God provides the manna from heaven or the water from a rock. Uh, That is, the conditions were against them, but God provided for them. All the time, the problem's been out there, and God has solved it. But now, for the first time, we find the problem's different. The problem is not out there. The problem is in here. It's the condition of their heart before the Lord. The problem is not what's going on in the world around them. The problem is what's going on inside them. They don't really have a problem anymore. They are the problem. Their sin is the problem. This is what needs attention. This is what's at fault. And even though this is the first time in the history of the nation Israel that that's been the case, really, uh, it actually is the story of the Bible from the beginning. If you go back to the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 3, again in the Garden of Eden, uh, what do we find? Adam and Eve rejecting God's will. God's blessed them in incredible ways, bountiful ways. He's, He's given them all they could ask for, and they listen to the serpent and follow the devices, the desires of their own hearts, and they flick God off and say, we'll do things our way, thanks. And that's the problem that the Scriptures open with. That's the problem that is the human problem. Yes, there are problems out there, and yes, we can call on God for help of those problems out there, but if you don't understand that the core problem, the key problem that we have is in our own hearts, then you miss what the Bible teaches us is the big problem. The root problem in the Scriptures is that we prioritize our own desires over God and his will and his glory. And I get this, right? I I can see this problem in myself all the time. It's hard sometimes, isn't it? It's hard. It's hard to submit your whole life to someone who you can't see. It's hard to feel like you want to submit your life and trust yourself to someone who you know could do anything but often doesn't give you what you want even if in the past he has shown himself to you, revealed his truth in history, even if in the past he has and is meeting our greatest needs, it's so easy to feel like I want to turn somewhere else because he's not doing what I want right now, and so I'll look for my desires to be met and put that before seeking his glory. But the rejection of God rightly leads to rejection by God. Unless, unless someone can change that story, 
unless the pattern can be broken, unless somehow that natural consequence of rejecting God, being rejected by God, can be interrupted. And that's what we find as we go on. Uh, Verses 11 through to 14, Moses, the intermediary between God and the people, he now stands there and intercedes, intervenes. He pleads with God not to do what God had resolved to do. He pleads with God that God would change his plans on this matter. And please notice how he does it. He doesn't do it this way. He doesn't say, oh God, they're not that bad. I mean, come on. It's, you know, it's only a golden calf. Uh, It's not a big deal. Or given the circumstances, given the situation, surely you can have a bit of understanding and leeway. He doesn't do that. He doesn't try and minimize their sin. He doesn't try and say, that's not really sin. It's not really a problem. You can brush it aside. That's not the Moses approach. His approach is to do with the character and reputation of God in the world. He says, God, if you were to wipe them out, what would the nations say? People know that Israel has been delivered from Egypt, and if you wipe them out, people might say, ah, that's because God is a wicked God. And what he wanted to do was bring them out, give them false hope just to strike them down in the desert. That's the kind of God he is. He can't actually deliver them, and he has no interest in delivering them. He just wants to strike them down in the desert. Well, God seems to hear this from Moses, and it seems that he accepts this argument, and as a result, he relents. Uh, He relents. He, He changes his mind. This is not what I'm going to do in the end. I'm going to do something different. Moses' intercession works. Now, you might have this thought quickly buzzing around your head if you're a sort of theological type, a doctrinal type. How can God change his mind? I don't think God changed his mind. That's a great question. That's the kind of question you should come to Bible college and we'll explore together. (laughs) But it's not the point of the story. So don't get distracted by that. That's not the point of the story. In the flow of the narrative, the points are these. The points are that God answers prayer. God hears our prayers. And perhaps even bigger than that, the point is that God's character is actually gracious, not destructive. And God will show his character that way. If you want to know who God is, you need to know he's the God of grace, not the God of destruction. So that's what God wants proclaimed throughout the the world. God doesn't want the world to look at his people and think, oh, he's the God of destruction. He wants people to think he's the God of grace, and he wants people to think that because that's who he is, and that's exactly what he does. That's the point that God is is a God of grace. So God is not going to judge them immediately or in the way he said, but the story's not over. And judgment's not completely out of the picture as we follow. And let's see what happens here. Verses 15 to 18, Moses comes down the mountain to what sounds like unholy partying of some sort. Not the sound of war, either victory or defeat, but it just sounds like revelry. Uh, And that's unsurprising, I guess, If you worship a false god, uh, then what you're doing is abandoning the self-control and the discipline that's sometimes needed to keep our eyes focused on the true God. But also you're worshipping a god who doesn't have the morality, the ethical framework of the true God. Uh, So that might mean that your morals and ethics go down the drain as well. This is always how it is, right? When your beliefs are distorted, your behaviour follows. So don't think that you can uh, think wrong and act right or think right and act wrong, these things are linked. And the people have changed what they think, and it's changed their behavior. Moses comes down, interestingly, now not representing the people before God, but now representing God before the people. And God has said he's not going to act as he had originally decided. Uh, But Moses now takes on God's anger. He comes down and he sees the people, and he's disgusted on God's behalf, as it were. In verses 21 to 24, we see Moses uh, interrogating Aaron about this and the lameness of Aaron's response. Like, really? Come on. You know, oh, you know what kind of people they are. That's just how they're disposed. And we put this stuff in the furnace and a calf came out. Who knew? Uh, Passing the buck, saying ridiculous things. I mean, it's just, it's preposterous, right? And if if it looks preposterous to us, imagine how it looks to God Who knows people's hearts? Who knows what's going on? Do you think this kind of rubbish is going to fly before God? Please don't think you can get away with spitting that kind of rubbish to God. Lame excuses. 
It's shameful. Verse 25 even says that Israel has become a laughing stock to the nations. Not glory to God. It's terrible. And so what happens? What happens at this point? Well, Moses now comes to deliver what is, uh, seems to be now God's new plan, which is not just to wipe the people out straight away like that, not just to completely destroy them, but to do something else. Moses draws a line in the sand. He draws a line in the sand, verses 26 to 29. He calls people to the gates and he says, if you are, want to return to the Lord, then come to me. If you want to come back to God, come to me now. Now is your chance to, in our language, repent. Give up what you were doing in the past. Come back to God. This is your chance for repentance. Please notice, judgment is still going to come, actually. It's not that God says there's going to be no judgment at all, but now is a time to repent, to leave that stuff behind, to walk away from it. God doesn't say, right, God doesn't say, um, I'm going to forgive the people, I'm going to relent, even if they persist. He doesn't say, keep worshipping the idol, keep having immoral parties, keep ignoring me, and I'll bless you and love you. Now, that's, that's not quite what it's saying. He's saying, you were doing that. Those things have characterized you. Now, if you walk away from them, then I will relent. If you leave that behind, there's no sense of I can stay indulging in my sin and continue to high-handedly ignore God and God say, oh, that's okay, I relent. No, the chance, the new thing that God's doing here, the opportunity they have is to take the chance to repent, to step away from their sin, to rally to Moses, to the place of forgiveness, and to leave that behind, and then God will forgive them. And who comes? Well, who we find out come are the Levites. So this is one of the 12 tribes of Israel, one of the 12 sons of Jacob was Levi, and this particular tribe, for whatever reason, they leave that behind. They say, actually, we don't want to be that anymore. We come back to you, and we stand with Moses and say, we relent, we turn away. This, by the way, is how the Levites first distinguish themselves. If you read the rest of the Old Testament, you find out that the Levites become a special tribe set aside for the purpose of administering this, this tent, this tabernacle where God's going to dwell, and later the temple. The Levites become specially set aside because they've distinguished themselves in their repentance and their faith. And this is the moment that they first do that. And so committed are they to the Lord and, and to his purposes and his ways, they even do something that to our ears sounds really horrendous. They even take up the sword against family members and brothers and sisters and fellow Israelites who have chosen not to repent. They become, in that moment, agents of God's judgment. What they're really saying in doing this is, so committed are we to the Lord, to his purity and to alignment with him, that we are ready to stand against those who are against him. Now, I think this is incredibly challenging. I don't know what I would have done in that situation. But it's a mark here. What we're meant to see in this context is it's a mark of incredible faith and fidelity to God. It reminds me a bit of Abraham taking Isaac up the mountain to sacrifice him to God, which, of course, isn't the way the story plays out. But that act of faith on Abraham's behalf, you think, I don't know if I could do that, but the Levites distinguish themselves in having this faith, in being prepared to do anything the Lord calls them to, particularly those things that show they are aligned with him and they are not on the side of those who are against him. Please notice something very, very important. This was only for a moment. Please notice that uh, there's still many people who don't repent, who the Levites don't destroy and wipe out. God will deal with them, as we'll see in a minute. And please note especially that this is not how things work when you come to the New Testament. When you come to the New Testament particularly, the practice is quite radically different. What we get, if you like, is in the Old Testament, God sets a paradigm. And the paradigm is holiness is important, allegiance is important, sin is bad, judgment is real. And this becomes experienced by the people of Israel in moments like this, where God shows these things as people are judged there and then by the hand of God's people. So that's established in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, it's reapplied and God says, you need to know that your enemies are over there, but I don't want you to judge them, I want you to love them. Jesus says that 
love your enemies. Love your enemies. Bless those who who persecute you. That is, still see the line in the sand, but the way you cross the line now is not in judgment, but in blessing and in love and in warning, saying that a judgment's coming, but we're not delivering it. And in a message of hope, saying, come to Jesus, repent. There's hope for you here in light of the coming judgment. Romans 12 makes this particularly clear. Romans 12 says that we're to bless our enemies and leave the judgment to God. There was a paradigm set in the Old Testament to help us see the seriousness of these things, but the way it plays out today is we go with love and the gospel, we leave the judgment to God in his time, in his way. The role of God's people is to share the good news and to warn people that the judgment is coming for those who don't repent. That actually... uh, was still the case then. Those who didn't repent would still face judgment. And you can see in verses 30 through to 35, the end of the passage, Moses, it seems, goes back for a second plead with God. He he pleaded with God that God wouldn't judge immediately the whole lot and just save him to make the nation. And God says, yes, okay, if they return, if they repent, if they rally to you and leave behind the idol, then I will relent. But now Moses seems to be going up for those who haven't relented. Uh, Would you have mercy on them, Lord? And God says... No, actually, my mercy is on offer, but it has to be received. My mercy is there. It's free, but you have to walk into it. Those who continue to high-handedly reject me, who continue to worship false gods, who continue to slight me, there's a judgment coming, I'm afraid. And that seems to make sense. And at the very end, there's this, this preview of that by the plague that comes through the camp. Well, it's sobering, isn't it? It's a sobering story, uh, and it's hard to read, but of course we have to read it because it's the word of the Lord to us, and there are lessons for us in this. And uh, much as we'd like to uh, only read the bright and encouraging parts of the Scriptures, uh, we have to hear the seriousness of these matters. God didn't put them in the Bible by accident. They're there to grow us. And I think actually as we look carefully, uh, we'll realize this is actually a story of grace and blessing and hope. Uh, Let me just close off then with with three points that I hope will bring some of this to the surface for us. Uh, The first point I want to make might not be the one you expect, but the first point is this. Leadership is important. Leadership among the people of God is really, really important. Jesus cries out that that his people are like sheep without a shepherd, and he grieves that. Sheep without a shepherd, they have no leader. Uh, he, he feels the weight of them, the, the, uh, the people of God being abandoned by those who should lead them. Leadership's really important because without leaders, people stray, people wander, people don't know the right way to go. Or, even worse, perhaps, bad leaders don't just let people wander and stray, but lead people in the wrong direction. And we see in this story, Aaron is a bad leader. He was there filling Moses' shoes while Moses was up the mountain, and he's a bad leader. Please understand, uh, he is someone, he's not, he's not a bad leader because no one regards him. They do regard him. They go to him. They ask for his direction. They ask him to, to do things for him. He's respected as a leader. He's not a bad leader because he has no authority. He has authority. The people defer to him. He says what they're going to do. We're going to have this festival. We're going to do that. He's, that's not why he's a bad leader. Uh, He's not a bad leader because he can't get things done. He gets some things done, just the wrong things. He's a bad leader because he follows the people rather than God. And in this case, he follows the people even when they're at their worst, when their hearts are inclined in exactly the wrong direction. Rather than being a good leader who calls them back to faith in God, he says, no, let's do that. He's a bad leader because he prioritizes the sinful whims of the people over the will of the true and living God. And I want to say to you that today's church actually, sadly, in many places is in the same situation. You might not realize it coming to this church because from what I see and what I hear uh, from people who are part of this church community Uh, You have, under God, faithful, holy leaders who bless you in leading you in the ways of the Lord. 
But you should know that even in our city and in our state, there are churches with no leaders. We at the Bible College get emails all the time from churches saying, do you have a pastor? Can you send us a youth minister? Uh, we want someone to work with our families or as an outreach worker. Um, there, there's a pastor drought out there. It's actually something that's being tracked across the Western world. There's a pastor drought. And to make matters worse, not only is there a pastor drought, there are many churches, and I, I hate to say it, but it's true. There are many churches where people teach things from the front, where there are leaders who up hold things that are against the will of God and direct people away from the Lord rather than to him. There are people who, who do that shamelessly and in a way that is terrifying, I think, in terms of its consequences. Leadership's important. We need more good leaders. We have a desperate need. South Australia requires more leaders if we're going to see the church maintain its health and strength into the next generation and beyond. Where are they going to come from? Well, here's my question. Could it be you? Could it be you? And you might think, well, no, it can't be me because I already do something else. Uh, I have another work that I do. You know, I'm, I'm a nurse somewhere. Or, you know, uh, I work on a building site somewhere else. Or, you know, I'm studying because I'm heading down this career path. Well, those things might be great. And praise God for the good works you do in those places. But we need some people who are going to let their tree be shaken, let their cage be rattled, and who are going to hear that the Lord might be saying, you know how you're heading this way? Actually, I'd love you to head this way. And to take up that mantle of being people who offer themselves into some kind of vocational service of the word. Uh, it's not just about fulfilling our own calling, although that is certainly a part of it. It's about service. It's about how can we bless the church beyond ourselves. And there's a million ways to do that. And I'm sure you all do it in lots of wonderful ways. But could there be some of us for whom the call is to take the next step and to make this our lives? I actually think every Christian should consider this. I don't think every Christian should do it. But I think every Christian should consider it prayerfully, seriously, uh, with people they trust around them, counseling them and advising them. Uh, and we should all be together discerning, as I said earlier on, whether any of us should be making that direction change to serve the church and serve the Lord in that capacity. Leadership is important. Bad leadership is disastrous. An absence of leadership is disastrous. Good leadership is important. Second thing to say, uh, and this is the obvious one, sin is bad. Sin is, in fact, horrendous. Uh, now, again, that's obvious, but actually we need to say it because I think sometimes in some churches, strangely and sadly and, 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 and in a way that I kind of get because maybe I do this myself too often, we minimize sin. We kind of say, yeah, sin's not great, but pff, what are you going to do? Or sin's not great, but we know we're all sinners, so, you know, sin's just part of life. And we kind of use that to minimize sin. Or some of us who are even, you know, thinking theologically, might make a theological argument about this. We might say, well, hang on. Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sin. Therefore, what I do doesn't matter. But that's a distortion of the gospel. That's not what the Bible teaches. It would be far better to flip it and frame it this way. What I do matters so much that Jesus had to die for my sin on the cross. Right? We have the free gift of forgiveness in Jesus, for sure. But what we do matters. And the Bible, the New Testament, is full of warnings against sin. And not just for people who are unbelievers, but even within the church, within the household of God, there are warnings. Don't sin. Don't take this lightly. Don't muck around with it. Sin is horrendous. Its consequences are bad. It's serious stuff. Which leads me to the third point, which is this. Yes, sin is horrendous. Yes, it's not to be trifled with. It's not to be made light of. But there's always a way back. There's always a way back. If you hear anything out of Exodus 32, hear that there's always a way back. In Exodus 32, we don't pretend there's no sin, but sinners are called to stop, cross the line, and return to God. Come to Moses, the deliverer, the God-given advocate 
for his people. Come back. There's a way. There's a way back. And of course, Moses is just the, the forerunner of Jesus. Moses served a small group of people for a short period of time, called them back, but Jesus is the one who Moses points to, is the one who Moses prefigures, if you like, who Moses prepares us for, the true saviour, the true deliverer, the one who for all eternity calls all people, everyone in the world, come back, come back now. There's a way, and the way is coming to Jesus. Jesus is the true saviour, the true Moses, if you like, the true uh, advocate from the Father. Like Moses, Jesus calls us to come to him if we want to line up with God and step away from our sin and from its consequences. Unlike Moses, though, Jesus does something more. Moses calls us out of our sin, but Moses doesn't actually deal with our sin. Jesus does. Jesus says, come to me, and when we come, he takes our sin on himself and dies on that cross, paying the judicial punishment for sin, so that God's justice is, is done, is meted out, is finished, is ruled out. And what that means is we can be sure, not just that we're in the right place, but that our sin is dealt with, because God is just. We have sin, and when it's punished, it's punished, and the punishment is done. God's a just God. He doesn't punish the same sin twice. He doesn't get punished in Jesus and then in me as well. If I'm with Jesus, my sin has been punished in him. It's dealt with. It is no longer part of the equation. Jesus does that more than what Moses did. And he does it for all of those people back in Moses' day, as well as all people everywhere now and in the future. He does it for us. Jesus is the saviour. In Jesus, God's holiness and justice are maintained because sin is dealt with, not just brushed aside, not just walked away from, but God's justice and holiness are maintained as God gives us grace and lets his holiness and justice be meted out on Jesus, our sacrifice and saviour. All we need to do is come to him in repentance and trust. So actually, Exodus 32 is a dark story, but in many ways, it's good news. In many ways, it's good news. Because here's the thing. Have you ever sinned? Have you ever sinned? Well, of course you have. We've all sinned. I've sinned. We, we've all sinned. But I wonder, do you ever think, yeah, we've all sinned, but my sin, or this particular sin I've got in my head, or a particular thing I did, or a period of my life, that was really bad sin. That wasn't garden variety sin. That wasn't like the sin of nice people. That was bad stuff. And I know God can forgive kind of sin generally and all the kind of little bitsy sins we do, but I don't know about that big thing that I'm pretty private about, but that gnaws at me inside. Do you ever think that? All sin's bad, but... I've got a particularly heavy sin that might be in a different category. Well, here's the thing. All sin is bad, and maybe your sin is in that category. I don't know. But the message of Exodus 32 is God can forgive even that sin. Even the most horrendous and horrific of sin, God can forgive it. And not just forgive it as in tolerate you, as in saying, oh, okay, I guess you can just come into my family. No, you can come right to Jesus, be at his table, be right in the middle of his family, have your, your sin washed away, be clean and pure and accepted by him eternally, no question. God has given Jesus as a saviour even for the worst of sinners, no matter what. His reputation, of course, his true character is not the God who destroys, but the God of grace. That's how he's proclaimed throughout the lands, that's what people see and that's what's true. So we have forgiveness in Christ if we trust in him. The greatest of sinners have love and the hope of eternity with Jesus. He's done it all through Jesus, all through our Savior. Moses showed us something of what it was like, but ultimately it was fulfilled in Jesus. So if you come to him, you can be assured of your forgiveness and your place in his future plans for your good and for his glory. Let's pray. Our Father, we, um, we talk about sin a lot. 
And we often talk about sin in the abstract or in terms of tame sins that seem not too bad. But sometimes, Father, we know when we look inside our hearts that we actually have sins that we really are ashamed of and that we carry heavily and that are personal and make us feel guilty and, and questioning whether we're in another category. We thank you for Exodus 32 and the message that even the most horrendous sin can be forgiven if we come to Jesus. So Lord, by your spirit, please draw us to Jesus continually. And as people who, who do come to him and who do call him Lord and Savior, keep us there and lift our hearts in the hope and joy of forgiveness and reconciliation and restoration and peace and joy. Thank you for Jesus, our Savior. And we pray in his holy name. Amen. Thank you. Well, let's stand to our feet and sing of our worthy God together. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. Do you know? Sing 
Jesus is worthy. Thank you, Tim, for bringing us uh, God's Word today. And, you know, I love one thing, one sentence that Tim said. He said, God will be gracious as He hears His people cry for help. Question is, where do we need to cry for help today? What is the obstacle in our lives? Have we put something else ahead of God? Has it become an idol to us? Is there sin that we need to repent of? God will be merciful. Come to Him. He has open arms. He will accept us. Why? Because Jesus is the provision. He dealt with sin once and for all. Question is, will we cry out? Let's just pray as we finish the service. Father, we just want to say thank you for this morning. Thank you for our time of worship together. Thank you for God's word penetrating our hearts. Help us, Lord, not to block off how you've spoken, but help us to put into action what you have spoken to us today. We thank you. Help us to go out into the world and be a witness for Jesus this coming week. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Just finally, there's just a couple of things I want to let you know. PVC is on this Wednesday night. Next Sunday, we have Pastor Graham leading us with Vision Sunday as we, as a church, set ourselves forward about how we're going to impact the world for Jesus. So come along, be here next week. And of course, tonight we have Found at 5. Love to see you here, 5 p.m. uh, over in the cafe. Uh, You are loved. It'd be easier if you were someone else. Is there a voice inside your mind that reminds you all the time the ways you're broken? Has it left you hopeless? It can be a hard, hard thing just being alive. It can be a dark, dark thing when you're trying to hide.